and I'll try and cover the basics of ultrasound stimulation and the basics of using the device along with some things that we know are coming up as obstacles to labs who want to use focus ultrasound stimulation and uh, experimental settings. So a bit about us, if you haven't um, attended a webinar before, uh, we're called Brainbox. I'm the application specialist at Brainbox. Uh, I, I, I have a research background. I got a PhD three years ago now. Uh, it was in Chris Chambers at Cardiff University Brain Imaging Centre using TMS to understand the chronometry of visual awareness in humans. And I also did a lot of pre-registration of open science. And along with my colleague, Mark, who will introduce himself in a second, we work for a company called Brainbox. And on the Brainbox side, we sell and support neuroscience equipment for human neuroscience with a particular focus on non-invasive brain stimulation. Uh, and that covers transcranial ultrasound stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and transcranial electric stimulation. In addition to that, we cover things like integrating TMS or any other brain stimulation uh, method with other modalities like EG of neuro navigation and near infrared spectroscopy. And we've also got like a sister company, which is like part of Brainbox, but so not part of Brainbox, where we cover not just the equipment that we provide, but we also support best practices in doing a technique. So, in, and that covers webinars, uh, practical workshops, and lectures that we put on every year, uh, more sometimes more than once a year. And in those, people can come through a workshop with no experience of a technique, and then you can get the chance to talk to experts within the field. Uh, so, we've done quite a few in the past at UCL, a TMS one in John Ruffles' lab, and a TDCS one in Sven Bessemann's lab, and that enables people to turn up very little experience and then leave with a very solid theoretical understanding of how the techniques work and a very large base of practical experience with the techniques to such an extent that you can go off and start to plan your own experiments with a bit more confidence. Mark, well, sorry I rambled on a bit there but I'm going to give you a chance to introduce yourself as well. It's quite all right, yeah. Um, I So I'm, my name's Mark Crawley, I'm kind of sat behind the scenes answering any questions that uh, people might want to post over the duration of the of the webinar. Um, I am a, a product specialist at, uh, at Brainbox. Um, I've exhausted all of the Lord of the Rings puns I can think of, so I won't subject you to one of those. Um, but I, my typical responsibilities in Brainbox is kind of the the uh, training and after sales support. Um, so at the end of this, should you be blown away by all this new technology and you really fancy buying um, some focused ultrasound equipment? Um, Typically, uh, in my role, it would be to visit you with the equipment, help you get set up, and, and so on with it. Um, so in the, in the COVID era, I am definitely getting cabin fever, but also enjoying some new challenges and, and understanding new roles that I can do. So yeah, enough about me. Rory, do you want to you kick things off? Carry on. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so the overview of the talk now is that the, the idea really is to kind of introduce a product and introduce the technique to beginners at the same time. So talking about what a lot of people are familiar with TMS or TDCS, uh, it's quite difficult to understand, actually understand how ultrasound works because it relies on a completely different method of administering energy to the brain. The ultrasound relies on an acoustic mechanism or like a very high frequency sound wave, whereas TMS and TDCS is all about electric fields and it comes as a bit of a shock, pardon the pun, to the system. So I cover what transcranial ultrasound stimulation is and I'll cover a bit about why it's exciting. I mean, I could probably talk your ears off for about two hours as to why it's exciting, but I've got to wriggle it in a bit for this. I'll just cover how it works, a tiny bit about safety and a bit of the safety bit is I'm going to refer you to the main papers that I know of that have discussed safety in depth. And there's also been some empirical work recently that's been done this year, which has addressed some of the concerns about safety that people had, uh, particularly last year. And there's also, uh, I'm gonna give you a quick demo of something called the Neurofrust Pro system. It's quite a difficult thing to demo when you're stuck in your lounge without all the equipment. Uh, so what, what I do have is I've got some MATLAB software that I've been working on. And I've got a, a TPO on my table that I might be able to show you as well. 
I'm trying to beef it all up to make it your attendance worthwhile by just talking about the technique and talking about how the neuropath system can be useful to do, achieve that technique. So here are what ultrasound is. It involves delivering a sound wave that humans can't hear. So the range of human hearing is at about 20 kilohertz. Whereas ultrasound, particularly for neuromodulation in humans, tends to administer a sound wave between 200 and 500 kilohertz. And the ultrasound is administered using something called a, um, a transducer, which you can see on the oh, oh, just click back to them. Uh, see on the left hand side here, uh, with a like the speaker concave shaped object thing, and it's shaped in a way that when you run current through that electrode, it will vibrate, and that vibration will lead to a sound wave being delivered. And you can see with the yellow oval in the middle there, when that, when, any, when that ultrasound transducer releases a sound wave, it is loudest in that yellow region uh, highlighted as the therapeutic focal zone. And what's really exciting about transcranial ultrasound stimulation is that that focal zone can be achieved by traveling through the skull and it can reach deep sites within the cortex without being distorted in any way and without experiencing a depth focality trade-off like you do with TMS and TDCS. So the sound wave is kind of focused at a certain point in the three-dimensional space. You've got your little concave tubes like that, and then you've got the um, focus of the transducer like that. And the, the ultrasound wave is delivered in a series of short bursts. Um, as you can see with my diagram on the on the right hand side, you've got like those blue columns and underneath you've got some light blue columns. What you do, well, there's very short pulses or bursts of ultrasound where the ultrasound is switched on for a very short period of time before being switched off again. And those pulses of ultrasound are repeated at a certain frequency for a certain period of time. So in the ultrasound literally, you, you, you want to think about the length of your pulse, which is the amount of time that the ultrasound is delivered for. And you've also got to think about the frequency that that pulse of energy is repeated at. And then generally in the literature, that kind of translates into you have an acoustic frequency of stimulation. So that's what frequency is the sound wave being delivered by the transducer. You've got the pulse length for the burst length, it's illustrated by those lighter blue columns along the bottom. That's long. How long is each burst of ultrasound? And you've also got to think about the pulse repetition frequency or the pulse repetition period. And that just means, as it so shows on the bottom left, it's the duration of time that separates the delivery of one pulse and the delivery of another pulse. And you can express the interval between two pulses in, a, in, in, in the interval between consecutive pulses in two different ways. You can express it in units of hertz or kilohertz as the pulse repetition frequency, or you can express it in the unit of milliseconds or microseconds using the pulse repetition period. They're both two sides of the same coin. They're both different ways of expressing the same thing. And I'll go into how you calculate that a bit later on. And you've also got something called the, the sonication duration, which is like illustrated by the darker blue columns along the top. The sonication duration is, okay, how long is each pulse that's re re repeated at pulse repetition frequency Y delivered for? So how long does the, how long are the bursts of pulses delivered for? That's called the sonication duration or the burst duration. And you've also got something that isn't really reported that much uh, in the literature, but it's called the interstimulus interval. And that's the duration of time that separates sonication in uh, the duration of time that represents each sonication. And some people report that because they will de deliver a burst of like a set of pulses of ultrasound for one trial and then wait for a few seconds before delivering a series of pulses on another trial. Some people were interested in that because they, they thought it was a relevant safety parameter, but it isn't actually reported by everyone. The main things are the acoustic frequency, pulse length, pulse repetition frequency, and the sonication duration. And on the, on the right hand side, I've got how these things translate into the neuroplast device. You got frequency, 
uh, on the top in the middle you've got the burst length on the bottom left the period on the, in the middle on the bottom and then the timer which refers to the the sonication duration so all these things could be set in a very straightforward way on the touch screen or you can do it in matlab which is the way i like to do things So to talk about what it is then, you're delivering short pulses or bursts of ultrasound that are repeated at a pulse repetition frequency. And another thing that's reported quite often is something called the, the duty cycle. And to calculate the duty cycle, at least there's one way of calculating the duty cycle, and that requires the pulse repetition period. And all that involves is taking the pulse repetition frequency, which is in, the, in this example, the pulse repetition frequency be 10 hertz. So each of these pulses along the bottom will be delivered at a frequency of 10 hertz. To get a pulse repetition period, you just divide one by the frequency, which is 10 in hertz, to give you up for one milliseconds, or you can convert that into milliseconds, give you 100 milliseconds. So that means that the pulse repetition frequency is 10 hertz and the pulse repetition period is 100 milliseconds. So that means that the interval between each pulse is 100 milliseconds. And then to work out the duty cycle, then it's it's like the ratio of the sort of the ratio of the the pulse length to the pulse repetition period. And in this example, I've kind of taken the, the same pulse repetition period, which is a, a hundred milliseconds, and then I've just chose a range of different pulse lengths and calculated the duty cycle for each one. So in one example, there's a duty cycle. Uh, a, pulse length of 30 milliseconds so you divide 30 by 100 and then multiply it by 100 to get your percentage you give 30 milliseconds 30 percent if the pulse length is 50 milliseconds you divide 50 by 100 to get 50 percent duty cycle and then if you have the pulse repetition period that equals the pulse length you get 100 milliseconds 100 percent duty cycle and if you've got 100 percent duty cycle that effectively means that you're administering a continuous burst of ultrasound so the ultrasound is kind of always on rather than being delivered in a series of discrete pulses or a series of discrete bursts. And a lot of the stuff um, that I saw from the Baden Baden meeting, the virtual Baden Baden meeting uh, last week that covered ultrasound is that you might think that delivering ultrasound continuously to the brain might be better at producing an effect. So obviously more energy, more effect. That's actually, actually quite counterintuitive because what you actually find is that if you administer ultrasound at a lower duty cycle, you're more likely to get an effect to the simulation physiologically. So in terms of the we, equipment, we did, for the we did have a hand up um, from Atilio Marino. Um, if there is a question, Atilio, we have a Q&A bit on the, on the left hand side of the screen. Um, so you're, you're very welcome to, to ask it or perhaps it was an accident. If you want to ask, please, please go ahead. Uh, go ahead and, and, and type it in. Sorry, Rory. Okay. So on the equipment side uh, for the Neurofus Pro system, it's actually very straightforward in terms of the components that it has. So you've got like your transducer, which is the speaker that I mentioned earlier. You've got a matching network that I'm going to talk a bit more about a bit more later on. And what that matching network enables you to do is effectively move the focus closer or further away from the transducer face well sorry the, the point where the ultrasound enters the head and the Neurofus system also has that a touch screen enables you to configure the parameters that you're interested in and you can also control it via matlab or python which is what i've been doing quite a lot over the summer so to, and I'm, i mean I've, like i said earlier i don't really want to spend about two minutes covering why uh, Neurofus is exciting, but um, I've kind of got to keep it as, as possible. But the kind of cool thing about it is we, we know it's doing something physiologically, and that's been confirmed using a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation. I'm going to assume that the majority of you in the audience already know what it is, but I'll just give you a brief overview to those that don't know what it is. It involves putting a, two coils of copper wire on the head that are wound together like that. You run a current through the copper wire very quickly and if you do that it creates a time varying magnetic field that could induce current in the brain if you put that coil on the head deliver a pulse it can induce current in the motor cortex and it can and then if you make measurements from muscle tissue as i'm illustrating in the bottom left of this example here you can evoke a measurable response by stimulating the cortex using transcranial magnetic stimulation 
If you deliver a pulse of ultrasound before a TMS pulse, it can change the amplitude of this TMS motor revoke potential, which means that it, it, we know it's doing something physiologically that we understand. That's good for us if we want to use short pulses of ultrasound to alter performance on behavior of tasks or administer short pulses of ultrasound to modulate components of evoke potentials. That means it also has a reasonable degree of temporal resolution in addition to the very good spatial resolution of ultrasound that I'm going to talk about later on. And in this example, and in this example, we think that the, I, I, I can't speak for all the experiments as a whole, but it looks like ultrasound has an inhibitory effect on neurons. And that's indexed by a, the application of ultrasound before a TMS pulse tends to reduce the amplitude of motor evoke potentials, which are generally seen as a measure of corticospinal excitability. Another thing about ultrasound, which is really exciting, and this is what's got the field all talking about it, is that you can not, you, know, you can simulate a deep area of the brain, which you cannot, you can't really do with TMS accurately, and you certainly can't do it with transcranial electric stimulation. So now you can stimulate deep areas that we've not stimulated before. Uh, it also produces a lasting offline effect of stimulation. So what I mean by an offline effect is that if you, in this study here, what they did is that they focused the ultrasound on the supplementary motor area and they applied ultrasound for 40 seconds. I think that was a 30 millisecond pulse length, 100 millisecond pulse repetition period. So the duty cycle was quite low, which is good from a safety point of view. And then what they found is that if you do ultrasound for 40 seconds, that has an effect that lasts for up to an hour and a half after the stimulation period. And that's not only really exciting from a potential therapeutic point of view, but it's also very exciting from a, uh, like a scientific causal understanding of the human brain point of view. And because you can focus the ultrasound on deeper sites, it kind of means that you can get all the places you wanted to stimulate with TMS that you couldn't reach. So when I was doing my PhD thesis ages ago now, I was doing it on predictive coding functions of the human brain. And a lot of the regions where evidence for predictive coding had been revealed were too deep to hit with TMS. And that's areas like the anterior cingulate cortex and the fusiform gyrus and areas like that. Another site which has generated a lot of interest in neuroscience, but we've never been able to stimulate it to produce uh, like a causal understanding of how it actually works. And that's sites like the hippocampus, which I know a lot of people are also excited about stimulating. And the other thing, in addition to be able to stimulate at depth, which is uh, like unprecedented in non-invasive brain stimulation, and that is that the, the, the site of stimulation can be made to be incredibly small. So in this case, I've got an example here where there's a red transduce that's been superimposed on an MRI scan. And you can see the acoustic energy being injected into the cortex as a very like narrow beam. If you take a closer look at that narrow beam, the, 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 by beam, I mean the ultrasonic, the passage of the ultrasonic wave through the cortex. You can see that the bit where that beam is loudest, where the acoustic intensity is, where the effect of ultrasound is likely to be maximal, that beam is absolutely tiny. And in this paper, they actually compared the size of the, uh, the, the acoustic maximum to retina top, uh, is it retina topic? What do I want? Topographically maxed thumb regions, index finger regions, and middle index fingers of the motor cortex by making people do finger tapping tasks while in an MRI scanner. The acoustic focus is absolutely tiny, which means that you can kind of focus on what's going on within specific regions of the brain. For instance, if you wanted to stimulate, uh, there was a big debate in TMS about 10 years ago now, where people were trying to stimulate area v1 of visual cortex so primary visual cortex and they're asking is it possible to just stimulate v1 and nowhere else and the answer is no because the tms pulse simulated v1 and it also hit parts of dorsal v2 and sometimes v3 it was actually impossible to get a maximal electric field within v1 without also stimulating v2 as well so ultrasound kind of enables you to focus it on specific parts of networks rather than stimulating parts of what two parts of a network if you like so it enables you to tease apart the contributions of little regions in brain networks to a greater extent than we've never been able to be done, do before 
there is a bit of a caveat to the, the size of the acoustic focus. So if you increase the frequency of the ultrasound being delivered by the transducer, you get higher spatial resolution. So the frequency of the stimulation goes up, the size of the focus goes down. But when you put the transducer on a real person's head and that ultrasound travels through the skull, the higher the frequency, the greater the rate of energy absorption by the skull. And that does two things. Number one, the absorption of energy in the head will, it causes the ultrasound energy to be scattered in different directions, which means the focus gets distorted or even moved around. And another reason is when you put a transducer on a head and you deliver a pulse at an incredibly high frequency is that it can start to increase the temperature of the skull, which is ideally something we want to keep to a minimum from a safety point of view. So as a result of that, there's been a bit of a compromise between the, the spatial resolution of what can be achieved and the frequency of stimulation that can realistically be delivered about distorting the focus or heating up the skull. And with Neurofus, uh, we've got a range of transducers available that enable you to stimulate from 200 to 600 kilohertz. One transducer operates between 400 and 600 kilohertz and the size of the focus is absolutely tiny. It's got a three millimeter diameter and a into two millimeter like length and that's like a think of it as the shape of like a, a cigar or a grain of rice like an ellipsoid in terms of how it looks we've also got one that operates at a slightly lower frequency of 250 kilohertz which is a slightly larger focus of six millimeters by 39 millimeters in an ellipsoid shape uh, that, and that's for human use usually within for human use it's between 200 to 500 kilohertz and that's because of the, the skull density of the human skull that those get through. With smaller animals, they have a lower skull density than, than humans, which means you can operate a much higher range, which is good because it also means you get a smaller focus to stimulate a smaller brain, which is what you're after. And for that, we've got a Neurofus UTX that can operate between 2 and 3 megahertz or 2,000 or 3,000 kilohertz. And that's got a resolution that's half a millimeter by 3 millimeter long ellipsoid of focus. And one thing that ultrasound is also really good at doing that I don't think the field is as excited about as it should be, which I'm not covering here in detail, and that's the ability to stimulate peripheral nerves. And a lot of the um, a lot of the work to stimulate peripheral nerve is actually some of the evidence that ultrasound can actually produce an effect that can be measured physiologically. It's got a range of transducers available, a range of frequencies that you can apply, and a correspondingly different focus sizes that are available. Uh, somebody, somebody has asked the question, uh, to show it excites tree effect, uh, show side excited effect in animal studies, but this excites tree effect has not been observed in primate and human studies. Is it possible to use for an excited tree effect? So I'm only really, I'm not saying that ultrasound can't produce excited tree effects. It's mainly a lot of the stuff that I've read so far suggests that something inhibitory is going on. If you can op get Neurofus to operate at the parameters that are required to produce an excited tree effect, then the answer is yes, you can. I hope that answers the question. So now I'm gonna talk about the intensity of ultrasound and it kind of requires you to think completely differently to how you think about the intensity of TMS and TDCS, but actually, kind of points out that the way the intensive TMS has been measured has been wrong all these years as a percentage of the maximum stimulator output of the device. So to, I'm going to talk to you about a weird hypothetical scenario now to talk about the intensity of transcranial ultrasound. And I'm going to get you to imagine that I've got a big tank of water in a, a cube and I've got a transducer on top and I'm just focusing the ultrasound at a point within that tank and I'm also measuring what's going on within that point and then there's two things that you really need to think about to understand the intensity of transcranial ultrasound and you need to think about not the intent not the intensity as in the power of the transducer you think about what's going on in the acoustic focus we're measuring the intensity in the acoustic focus not power of the transducer and that's important because what we want to think about is what the intensity is within the cortex rather than what the intensity is within the transducer itself and there are more or less two common ways of measuring um, the intensity of ultrasound 
in addition to a couple of other indexes that I'll cover later on. One which is called the ISPPA, which stands for Spatial Peak Pulse Average Intensity. And what that is, is it's measured within that focus region that I'm pointing with my tank of water. And it's the average rate of energy absorption in watts per centimeter squared are averaged across pulses. And that's generally used to measure heating. And that, that's the one that's most relevant to the safety of ultrasound in humans. And we've also got uh, the ISPPA, which is the spatial peak pulse average. I've got that. Sorry, I've got they're both the same. The bottom one next to mechanical is supposed to say ISPTA, which stands for spatial peak temporal average. And that is the average intensity measured within a medium like the water tank. And that's the average intensity over time rather than the average simply averaged across pulses. If you're good at maths, you'll figure out that the ISPTA has a bigger denominator, denominator than the ISPTA, which PPA, which means that the ISPTA is usually lower than the ISPPA. And these measure more or less measure two, two separate things. One measures the, the ISPPA measures the thermal effect and the ISPTA measures something I call a mechanical effect. And when you deliver ultrasound to something, you can do two things. One is it can cause it to heat. The other thing it can do is it can cause the surface to vibrate a little bit. Uh, the space peak pulse average measures the risk of heating. The ISPTA measures the risk of something called cavitation. The thing with IS cavitation is that, is that Neurofuss has been designed to avoid the risk of cavitation altogether, and it can't actually operate at a power high enough to produce it. So the Neurofuss system is limited to um, an intensity of 30 watts per centimeter, a nice PPA, 30 watts per centimeter squared by standard. And you can turn it off to operate at 60 watts per centimeter squared if you like to, but it just can't reach a power high enough to cause things like cavitation. Things like heating are things we'd like you to look out for. And I'm going to cover that in a bit more later on. Yeah, and you've also got something called the mechanical index and the thermal index which are also used to measure as a, as a general guideline to measure whether there's a risk of a thermal or mechanical effect coming in. Now we're going to cover the exciting bit of the webinar, and that's kind of how you can achieve cortical and subcortical stimulation with the same transducer with the neurofus system. Um, what the, it can do is it can electrically steer where the acoustic focus is. And that enables you to stimulate deeper sites and it enables you to stimulate more superficial sites with the same transducer without any calibration or lensing or things like that. And that enables you to replicate all the cool stuff that's been done stimulating deep sites, like, uh, like I mentioned previously, and the superficial sites as well. And I've just got a couple of examples showing how ultrasound has been focused on the thalamus. This wasn't with the, the neurofus system but it was done with a kind of one you had to build yourself. And there's also one that stimulates the sensory cortex, which is a bit more superficial. And I'll talk a bit about how you can achieve cortical and subcortical stimulation with the same transducer. But to do that, the, the ultrasound transducer has actually got four elements, <laughs> four elements, put the wrong hand there, four mini transducers in it. Each of those transducers forms like a concave dome shape and they're all stacked on top of each other. Each of those transducers has been calibrated in a way that you can achieve the same intensity at different depths, even though the power of the transducer to achieve that intensity might differ. And with Neurofus, you can keep the focus more or less the same size if you steer the focus from 30 millimeters to 70 millimeters from the point where the ultrasound enters the head. And in this example, I'm just going to talk about something hypothetical where you want to simulate one site that is 42 millimeters from where the ultrasound ends the head, and another scenario where you wanted to stimulate somewhere 62 millimeters from the head, but you wanted to achieve the same intensity of stimulation at each of those distances. And just throughout this, this is kind of the focus kind of comes out from like along the axial plane from the face of the trade transducer from the point where the ultrasound enters the head. So we should just draw like a straight line coming along the bottom of the transducer. That's how it can be steered. It's along the axial plane 
So in this case, then I've got I kind of got an example of the device on the right hand side. If you look at the top right where it says focus, obviously I've stored did it to I've just not simulated to 42, actually did it to 40.3.2 because I'm an idiot. But the point is, uh, you need more power to achieve the same intensity at 62 millimeters compared to when you want to achieve the same ISPPA at 42 millimeters. And an analogy for that is a kind of if you wanted to get your friend to hear you and he sits standing a meter away, you can just talk to him normally. Whereas if your friend's standing, I don't know, 20 meters away, you've got to speak louder and increase the um, power of your voice for the acoustic wave to travel far enough to reach your friend. The ultrasound transducer can do that for you. It can achieve the same ISPPA at two different distances by changing the power of each element within the transducer. And each transducer is individually calibrated in like a, a water tank. So if you were to change the focus depth, as I'm showing you on the top right corner of each of these examples, if you were to change the focus depth from 43.2 millimeters to 62.2 millimeters, it will automatically change the acoustic power, which is indicated by P actual on the touch screen to achieve the same ISPPA. So in both of these examples, the ISPPA is 18.12 watts per centimeter squared. But when you're steering it to 43.2 millimeters, the acoustic power is 5.9 watts per channel. Whereas to get it to um, 62.2 millimeters, you need a slightly higher power of 14.3 watt, watts per channel. But the resulting ISPPA at where you want the acoustic maximum to be differs between these two things. And that's what enables you to be cortical and subcortical stimulation using the same transducer. And as I mentioned earlier, we have got this steering range available, and that's the ranges that the transducer can be moved. And the default is 30 millimeters to 70 millimeters from the point where the ultrasound enters the head. This can, we can also do a, a custom steering range for a cast. And you can also be quite clever and stimulate just outside the 70 millimeter steering range. So let's say, for example, the length of this acoustic focus is 22 millimeters and you move the acoustic focus to 70 millimeters, you've still got uh, 11 millimeters of the width of the beam that overlaps, goes over 70, and actually enables you to go up to 80 millimeters, 80 millimeters, 80 millimeters stimulation depth. And that's, like I said, achieved by automatically changing the power of each element within the transducer to achieve the same ice PPA at distance. That's all done automatically for you. There's also an advanced mode you can set within the transducer and that, that enables you to set the power to whatever you like. You can set the power of each element independently. You can set the frequency of each element individually. And you can also change the phase of the each element as well. I'm not sure if many people will be interested in phase, but the feature is there. And there's also more sophisticated uh, transducers been developed that have more than four elements where things like changing the phase and changing the power will actually be really critical. And you can do all of this in MATLAB and Python or anything else that you can connect with using it. And um, we've got a question now. I'll try and answer this now. I've got two screens here so I can read it. Uh, last week at DHK was a presentation and it was mentioned you can stimulate the focus and change its focality mainly on one of the planes. I'm not sure it's a sagittal one, it's not so focal on your two planes. This was due to the use of just uh, one transducer, so can you use a compensate it by having good focality in all planes, work with a second transducer. So what this one does, it can keep the focus more or less the same shape by having four it's four mini transducers there's four mini transducers um within a big transducer and the power of each transducer will compensate for each other so the focus remains more or less the same size throughout the steering range and the guy uh taiwan kim who asked the question earlier so to answer your question um the, the device, the, the device, this device can achieve 
whatever you like it to achieve as long as pulse repetition period, the pulse length and the sonication duration to produce a excitatory effect are known. So if you know all the relevant parameters here on the left hand side that can produce an excitatory effect, then yes, it can. I was just referring to some papers that I've read before this one on inhibitory effects. So as long as you know the parameters that you can program into Neurofus to produce an excitatory effect, then yes, it can do one. Okay, so I was just talking about, yeah, we can also, rather than just relying on changing the, uh, the focus value on the touch screen, you can also arbitrarily control the power of each channel. And that's also important for things like K-Wave simulations and acoustic simulations that I'm going to talk about a bit later on. Um, so in terms of the safety, then I'll focus mainly on the ISPPA and the ISPTA, but there are also other things like a thermal index and a mechanical index. And I don't really have time to cover safety in detail. Um, uh, I don't really have much chance to go into safety in as much detail as I'd like to, but there, I have got some safety papers here that I can refer you to. Uh, so in terms of the safety then, in terms of formal guidelines, there aren't any formal guidelines yet. Um, but that's mainly because they don't exist. But I do know that there are focus groups working on having similar guidelines for transcranial and humans to the um, guidelines that are available for TMS and TDCS for brain simulation. Uh, there are guidelines available for diagnostic ultrasound, which differs quite a bit from transcranial ultrasound. So you think about uh, diagnostic ultrasound, um, you've got to like have your transducer on a surface and then your objective is to move that transducer around a surface area to image beneath it. Um, and then with, with diagnostic ultrasound, you kind of, you deliver the ultrasound, you wait for it to bounce off a surface and then you deliver another burst. There's a bit of a big difference in the sense that you kind of have to move the transducer around, which you don't really do at all in transcranial ultrasound. And you've also got a very long duration between bursts. Whereas with um, transcranial ultrasound, your objective really is to keep the transducer in one place and you would just want to focus as much energy as safely possible within a very small place. So there are big differences. And in general, that I'll, you can refer to the safety papers if you want to know more, but most neuromodulation studies have an ISPPA that's between 0.5 and 100 watts per centimetre squared, don't really reveal any problems. And if ISPPA less than 30 watts per centimetre squared hasn't revealed any at all. And yet, if you want to read more about the safety, I'd do a screenshot of this page here. There's two papers that were published last year, just covering the state of the art with safety and covering parameters people use, the species of the subject we used, and whether there was any evidence of damage. And in these two papers, there were some concerns that were raised that the field as a whole is no longer concerned about. So um, there was a paper that was published this year uh, that kind of showed that the concerns that were raised were actually just due to the use of Sheep, path, sheep pathology to measure evidence of bleeding induced by focus ultrasound. And what I actually showed in this paper published this year is that sheep who don't receive any ultrasound have exactly the same brain pathology as the ones that did. So there's no difference between ones who received ultrasound and the controls. So the, the concerns raised in these two papers, the field has kind of moved on and they're not as concerned about this anymore. So if you're going to read those two 2019 papers, please read the Gar et al. 2021 as well. And then in terms of safety as well, they've also done the um, like a retrospective safety questionnaire where they've given people up sound and then sent them a questionnaire, a series of follow-up questions to see if they experienced any of the symptoms. Um, and on the whole, they are all, all, all absent, and that's covered in the Ghana Cell 2020 in scientific report, if you want to follow up on that. Uh, 
and as like I said earlier, there aren't any like published guidelines on how to do it, but um, that what the, the current recommendation is for each participant that you do, you've run some form of acoustic simulation to confirm that when you put the transducer in a specific place on a CT scan and then you deliver a certain ultrasound protocol, you run a simulation that confirms that you don't heat the skull and you don't heat the brain as, as much. But obviously, the skull is the principal concern, the ultrasound neuromodulation. And what this K-Wave toolbox can do is it can give you an estimate of the temperature in the skull, and it can give you an estimate of the temperature in the brain, and that's the temperature at the focal point. And this K-Wave toolbox is free, and it's the one that you most commonly see used in publications at the moment as well. So it's kind of been verified already as well. Another good thing about this K-Wave toolbox is it also enables you to figure out if skull geometry is influenced by um, influences the acoustic focus. If you, the skull, if you put the ultrasound on the skull at a particular angle, the, the shape of the skull can distort the focus in a particular way and move where you're focusing the ultrasound. So you can use the K-Wave toolbox to find the best place to, to put your transducer before you're in an experiment to make sure you're hitting a target. K-Wave toolbox is very useful. I would highly recommend it. And it's also worth pointing out that, um, that the, the things I was talking about earlier here, uh, this, is all, this is called a, like a free field estimate, which means that there's nothing obstructing the passage of the ultrasound through the water. That's, whereas in real life, um, what you tend to see is that the ultrasound is derated in some way by the skull. And the Neurofuss system can estimate the free field ISPPA uh, a standard on the touchscreen. But if you want a derated estimate, that does rely on you doing some form of acoustic simulation. And we have a question. So, yeah, um, so you're asking if you want to simulate mice. So, yeah, the answer is. So with the small animal trans transducer I mentioned earlier, the, the steering range is a lot shorter. So for humans, you can move it 30 to 70 millimeters. For small animals, you've got a steering range ranging from zero to 10 millimeters. And the focus is very small and you can, uh, you can fo focus it up to 10 millimeters. And if you wanted to reach further, you can have a custom steering range built into that transducer as well. And there's another question. Is it possible to keep a probe at a certain distance from the skull? Uh, there's nothing stopping you putting a probe there to measure what's going on. Um, it might I'll, I'll alter the, the path of the transducer itself. And, and I don't know if it would produce thermal effects. But the, the main problem there is that when you're doing ultrasound, you tend to need, well, you need some aqueous gel separating the transducer from the head. And you want to avoid bubbles uh, in that aqueous gel. You want to avoid having anything that can change the speed of sound because that can lead to problems. So if you were to put a probe underneath the transducer, it would affect how the transducer is coupled to the head. And the transducer ideally just needs either water or aqueous gel separating it from the head for it to pass through the skull safely. So the introduction of a probe would kind of could lead to the ultrasound traveling through more air to reach the site. And you want to have the transducer avoid traveling through air really you want to the whole reason why we use things like uh coupling systems which i'm not going to go into in this but i can go into them a bit more at the end um is that you want either the aqueous the aqueous gel to help the transducer travel through the head with no air whatsoever i hope that answers the question
so now a lot of things that are really asked about as well is like can we do um cam ultrasound and it, is it can is it possible for um people to distinguish between sham ultrasound and active ultrasound and what is it's kind of like a developing field at the moment and we don't really know what's best to have a double blind design for human use but we have an idea of what works best and previously in a lot of these studies i mentioned so far uh, they've used this ultrasound waveform in red where the ultrasound is switched very very suddenly switched on and then switched off very quickly and it was pretty and like in the study when they did a mechanical model of the human head they compared this very sharply on an off weight form to like a, a smooth ramp up of power of the transducer and although the ultrasound is outside of the range of human hearing when you put the transducer on someone's head if you put the transducer on someone's head the ultrasound will travel through the skull and then the skull will absorb some of the energy and vibrate a bit and when that, that shear wave of vibration happens that releases some energy that skull vibration can be picked up by the cochlea so it's the skull vibration that's that's heard not the ultrasound itself and in this study what they showed is that they did the mechanical of the head and specifically focused on the inner ear and they found that this ramped waveform cause less displacement of the cochlea than the classic sharply on and off waveform. There are a few caveats to this uh, that I'm not going to go into now, um, but the field is working on what the best waveform is and it's looking like ramping is best. A neurofus can deliver a series of different ramp lengths and a series of different models that determine the shape of the ramp, like a linear ramp or a um, an exponential ramp so a linear one would be just like a straight basic straight line relationship an exponential one would be more of a curved relationship between the, the rise from zero to maximum acoustic power and this is kind of um a good question and i'm not even sure that people really um know the answer to this yet but the answer will be here and somebody's asked how should the intensity of the ISPPA or ISPTA be determined in TMS experiments motor threshold AMT slash uh, resting motor threshold serves as a reference how about in test experiments the short answer is I don't think we really know what the best ISPPA or ISPTA is but what you can find out is that we are going to be running a workshop an online workshop towards the end of this year um with professor jamie tyler who's very much the godfather of transparent ultrasound and dr lenard hagen and all these sorts of questions where we don't really know answers you'll be able to ask them directly and they know far more than i ever would uh, and we also so you'll be able to come to the the workshop and you'll be able to ask any questions that you're uncertain of about the use of transcranial ultrasound so what how do you determine what intensity to stimulate people at uh how do you do how, like k-wave modeling um safety implications all the things that would serve as potential obstacles to running focused ultrasound research you'll have a chance to ask questions to overcome them at this webinar uh, like three-day workshop uh, that we're running at the end of the year and it'll be our practical thing and then um, some theoretical backgrounds. So what we know about um, how the effect arises, I didn't really cover that here, but the theoretical background served by how a mechanical way you can influence a neuron and how that neuron could manifest itself in terms of an effect. And there'll hopefully be a K-Wave modeling practical session there as well. So I've now got one more question. Uh, so I've got what the next thing we'll be covering is the matter uh, run through with the Neurofus Pro software and before I move on I'll just answer one more question so planning where to place the transducer on a subject's head you must consider the skull shape and the bone yes 
and the transducer will generate ultrasound beams which will be con concentrated on a focal area. As the brain has a network, shall we take into consideration which areas will have the ultrasound beam to go for on stimulation or to be avoided? That is a good question for the workshop. So the moment it, the, you can, can control where the acoustic maximum is and it can travel through certain areas, but whether areas outside of the outside of where you're stimulating uh, has an effect is kind of unknown really but the fact that in this paper here they they focused the ultrasound on one site and they found a, a change in functional connectivity pattern that was consistent with it only hitting a pre-sma because it also affected distant uh, remotely connected areas Right, Mark, I'm going to need you to help me now as I am about to get... You've trailer. possibly just answered another question which was hidden in there as well, um, which is, would deeper stimulation also result in higher dispersion of a sound wave in surrounding tissue? Uh, so the, the point really is that the ultrasound does have to travel through more tissue to get there but because of the shape of the transducer and the power of the transducer yes it will travel through more tissue to get there but the point where the ultrasound is loud enough to be produce an effect will be focused to a very small area so yes there will be more dispersion at more depths but the the point where the ultrasound is loudest and loud enough to produce an effect is still very small, if that makes sense. So there'll be loads of small effects on the run-up to the focus, but because you've got a concave transducer with four elements on it that you can control the power of, it'll release the energy as a wave, and then the, there's four separate waves, and then the bit where the focus is smallest, that'll be where the, the image sound is loudest, and the, it won't spread, be as loud in surrounding tissue, if that makes sense. If I could visualize it on a screen and show you the passage of a wave through tissue, you would you'd see it, but I can't now, fortunately. Uh, I can follow up later on with that question to answer it, because it's difficult to do without the assistance of some form of video or diagram. Cool. So this software here is something I've been working on for like the past month in MATLAB, really. And it's designed to kind of bridge the gap between the, the, the focused ultrasound system that we provide and the, um, the published protocols that we know in the literature. And it's to kind of provide a bit more of a confidence that you're applying a protocol that's safe because it's very easy to pick up on a protocol that we know has been used before and that's been published before that we know is safe instead of developing your own protocol. And if you look at all the pulse lengths and pulse repetition periods and frequencies and sonication durations that are available, it's much easier for you to focus on something that's been done before and see if that works rather than going out into the open on your own. So what this soft which software does is it will automatically hunt for ways of connecting to NeuroFuss. And then you just find out the one that corresponds to NeuroFuss in the device manager and then you click connect, which I've just done. And then that gives you this green light to say that it's connected. And then you can select the target that you're stimulating. And if I select brain here, what it will then do is give me a list of protocols that have been published before that have produced effects that have stimulated brain tissue. And then you can select one of these. It will automatically populate all the fields. Um, and then all you got to do now is say you want to put the power in milliwatts. In milliwatts, let's do that. There's all of that for you. And in the literature, people tend to report the pulse repetition frequency. But on the technical side, what the device needs to know is the pulse repetition period. So what this will also do is it handles the pulse repetition frequency to pulse repetition period conversion for you. So you don't really have to worry about making loads of calculations manually and getting stuff wrong. And it will also calculate the duty cycle for you. So in this case, the um, 
the pulse length was 360 microseconds and the pulse repetition period is one millisecond. Uh, 360 microseconds in milliseconds is 0.36. So if you divide 0.36 by one multiply by 100, you get 36%. So it's 36% duty cycle. And then all you then need to do is select a focus depth from this nice little slider here, which you can do with that. And then you select your transducer because what that will do is make sure that the frequency you're choosing in the acoustic frequency uh, window here can be achieved by the transducer that you have connected. Then click configure. And then it will configure the Neurofus device, which I've conveniently got situated here. Just configured it for me. And then it will show you the relationship between the burst length and the pulse repetition period as well. You can also select some of the more well-known protocols. So this study here, Dalla Piazza itself, was very, very influential because this was the first one to apply a sonication duration for 40 seconds and then um, produce a lasting effect in pigs without damage. You can do that and select the frequencies that are used. So in this case, I need to pick a different transducer. And then if you try to do a protocol that you don't have the transducer for, it tells you, please use the right transducer. So it kind of gives you the confidence that you are by mistake thinking you're administering 250 kilohertz of a transducer that's not designed to administer 250 kilohertz. And that's that. And you can also just change the focus depth to whatever you want. And there's also the, the paper that I mentioned previously, um, which stimulated uh, the Verhagen top paper that stimulated the SMA and the frontal polar cortex and revealed a lasting offline effect. That one is in there. And this protocol here wasn't just, it hasn't just been used to stimulate the frontal polar cortex and the SMA and produce lasting effects. It's also been used to stimulate the anterior cingulate cortex and the amygdala if you're interested. So it kind of saves you trawling through the literature to find the, pro the parameters because they're all there included. It's also got the, uh, the protocol that stimulated the thalamus. And what you actually find is that in reality, uh, if you look at the title of each of these protocols, most of them have done pretty much the same thing, which is a one millisecond pulse pulsed at 500 hertz. And all they've then done is change the acoustic frequency. It's also possible to move on to peripheral nerve studies. Uh, I ain't got many of these and we'll probably work on populating this more in the future. And if the published study used more than one parameter, it enables you to select from that list of parameters before you proceed. And that's that. And then it's also got a very nice custom mode built in as well. So let's say you wanted to work on protocol that had been used by somebody else. Um, so let's say you wanted to amend this paper here. You wanted to change it slightly. What I did then is I selected the protocol from the brain drop down menu. And then I changed my transducer and then I changed the target to custom. And if you're doing custom, that means you can kind of pour it whatever you like in. And you will get a bit of a, a warning to say that you're going into no man's land and you might not be doing stuff that's been pre-published before. What this enables you to do then is let's say you wanted to do the same pulse length as Ligonotalis, the metathalamus, you wanted the same uh, pulse repetition period as Ligonotal, but you just wanted to change the acoustic cubic to find 50 milliseconds. Just change it like that and then configure it. And then it's done. Oh, you can all that. And then that that's that. And you can change whatever parameters you like to go in there. And it enables you to bridge that gap between the literature and the technology itself. This is still kind of a in beta testing at the moment. I'm still making sure that it's all working incredibly smoothly before we roll it out to customers, but it will be included for free when it comes out when the Neurofus Pro system is published. He's released purchase. Um, so that is the end of the demo and I'll now move on to any other remaining questions.